Pază în corbu. Bună ziua, reluăm dezbaterile prin abordarea temei generale, natura și întinderea problemei, ideea centrală, întrucât colegul nostru, așa se întâmplă cu judecătorii, domnul profesor Tudorel Toader, care trebuia să susțină comunicarea starea mediului și provocările sistemului juridic în vederea asigurării protecției sale, este ținut într-o ședință specială la Curtea Constituțională pentru aspeții noștri. România se află într-o perioadă preelectorală, alegeri locale și marea problemă dacă alegerile într-un tur sau în două tururi este, sunt constituționale sau nu, a declanșat o avalanșă de contestații în fața curții pe care trebuie să le soluționeze rapid pentru că începe să curgă termenul de definitivare a candidaturilor. În această situație, colegul nostru, dr. Tudor Avrigianu, șeful Departamentului de Drept Penal al Institutului de Cercetări Juridice, va susține o comunicare, mediul ca valoare socială protejată, cu precizările și îngăduințele de rigoare că domnia sa a avut un timp mai scurt la dispoziție spre a redacta intervenția. Vă rugăm, domnule Avrician. So, mulțumesc mult, domnule director, monsieur le président de l'association, monsieur le professeur, mesdames et messieurs, cu această proba de limbă franceză se oprește aici, voi vorbi la rândul meu în limba română. E, și am să încep cu permisiunea dumneavoastră prin a explica titlul intervenției mele pe care l-a comunicat domnul profesor Duțu, și anume Mediul ca valoare socială fundamentală. Nu pentru că aș fi un mare susținător al uh, ideii din potrivă, dar term, prin termenul de valoare socială fundamentală, teoria dreptului penal și din România obișnuiește să desemneze așa numitul obiect juridic al infracțiunii. Ca să spunem că o conduită este infracțiune, trebuie să indicăm entitatea împotriva căreia această conduită este îndreptată. Și pentru că vorbim despre un drept penal al mediului, se ridică problema de a se ști dacă și în ce condiții și mai ales care ar fi implicațiile considerării mediului și aici vorbim de mediu în sens larg, pentru că incriminările din materia dreptului penal al mediului sunt variate și pot fi identificate de fiecare dată obiecte juridice specifice. Vorbim totuși de mediu în sens larg pentru a putea determina, din punct de vedere sistematic, locul unui drept penal al mediului în ansamblul dreptului penal. Vorbim, iată, de un drept penal al mediului, așa cum vorbim între timp de un drept penal al afacerilor. În definitiv, care este locul mediului în sistemul valorilor sociale fundamentale? pentru a încerca măcar o imagine cât mai completă a problemei, trebuie să încep cu, chiar cu noțiunea însăși de valoare socială fundamentală, în definitiv când și cum a apărut. Ea a apărut odată cu pozitivismul juridic. Ce a fost înaintea ei? 
înaintea ei a fost un termen pe care juriștii îl resim ca pe ceva mult mai familiar, și anume dreptul subiectiv. Și ce a fost înainte de dreptul subiectiv? Ei bine, înainte de dreptul subiectiv, aș îndrăzni o conceptualizare largă, destul de brutală, dar cred că ajutătoare pentru noi, mai ales că în finalul intervenției ne vom întoarce în acest punct, înainte a fost pur și simplu societate, a fost ordinea socială. Ordine socială unde avem o incriminare cu care cei de la 1800 au cumva aceleași dificultăți precum avem noi cu dreptul mediului și anume blasfemia. Înainte de Revoluția franceză, blasfemia era delictul suprem. Să spunem, cu Revoluția franceză apare o nouă ordine. Apare o ordine în al cărei centru se află individul și drepturile lui. În consecință, apare ideea unui drept penal a cărui sarcină constă din doctrinele contractului social citire în apărarea drepturilor acestui individ. Poziția sau locul sistematic al blasfemiei este fascinant. De pildă, vedem adevăratele acrobații conceptuale la care se supune un Feuerbach atunci când, printre drepturile lui subiective, are de-a face cu Gotteslästerung. Dar nu numai blasfemia este o incriminare problematică. Apar în plus toate acele incriminări care, sau al căror în ghimilele, păcat din perspectivă modernă, constă în aceea că nu permit o raportare directă la drepturile individului. Și în condițiile în care Termenul de drept subiectiv se dovedește deja mult prea strânt, apare un concept magic, apare în Germania ca Rexgut, bun juridic, apare în Italia ca bene juridico și care se poate traduce chiar așa, ca bun juridic și care definești, desemnează tot ceea ce legiuitorul penal consideră demn de a fi protejat, util de a fi protejat. Și de aici se poate continua discuția până în universul dreptului penal român care alege să traducă acest bun juridic prin valoare socială fundamentală. Este terminologia clasică folosită de la Vintilă Dongoroz până în zilele noastre. Ordinile sociale, așa cum vedem inclusiv în România și în Europa de Est, se succedă, terminologia pare a rămâne neschimbată. Iar dacă ne raportăm la o prezentare sintetică a părții speciale din anul, să spunem, 1977 și o comparăm cu una din 2016, o să vedem că multe lucruri sunt schimbate, însă osatura a rămas. Și acum...
se ridică întrebarea ce ar fi mediul ca valoare socială fundamentală. Și la această întrebare, care aparent este destul de simplă, au încercat destul de mulți autori să dea un răspuns, mai ales acolo unde, precum în Germania, paradigma drept bunului juridic, sau să spunem noi, a valorii sociale ca obiect al ocrotirii penale, a intrat în criză. Și nu pot să nu evoc aici o serie de contribuții ale profesorului Günther Stratenwert, de la bază, care a scris o serie de articole, dacă nu mă înșel, a avut o prezentare foarte plină de substanță, chiar la o întrunire a IDP, prin 1993, dar s-ar putea să mă înșel la bază, și profesorul Stratenberg a spus, nici mai mult, nici mai puțin, că în condițiile societății industriale, problema mediului trebuie tratată ad literam ca problema a supraviețuirii societății. Ce spunea profesorul Stratenberg mai departe? Spunea că un drept penal centrat pe individ în condițiile în care atacul, atacurile la adresa mediului amenință să pună sub semnul întrebării existența socială, se dovedește a ține deja de trecut. Eu aș îndrăzni să vă propun o perspectivă în care întreaga viziune a dreptului penal ca uh, uh, instrument destinat ocrotirii valorilor uh, fundamentale, a bunurilor juridice, este în întregime de trecut și nu neapărat pentru că este falsă, ci nici măcar nu este falsă în totalitate, ci am spune acolo unde nu este falsă, nu face decât să exprime tautologii, o nouă perspectivă a dreptului penal, așa cum a fost teorizată de altfel de autorii grupați în jurul așa numitei școli de la Bonn, Günther Jacobs, unul dintre autorii principali, și care spune că în loc de bunuri juridice, care nu spun nimic și a căror origine trebuie căutată tot în ideologiile contractului social și al individualismului corelat cu Revoluția franceză, trebuie să reașezăm normele, sau cum ar spune profesorul Jacobs, identitatea normativă a societății. Dintr-o astfel de perspectivă, problema care se ridică, problema teoretică ridicată de așa numitul drept penal al mediului, nu constă atât în a identifica punctual valori sociale, și cu atât mai puțin în a afirma mediul este o valoare socială fundamentală. Multe sunt valori sociale fundamentale. Oricare incriminări din oricare cod penal îi se poate găsi, printr-o lectură chiar a textului, valoarea socială fundamentală, fără ca prin aceasta să, să fie rezolvată problema situării sistematice acele incriminări în cadrul dreptului penal nu privit în absolut, ci raportat la locul, la timpul și la, mai ales la societatea căreia acest cod penal îi aparține. Și atunci, putem, de pildă, considera conduitele care aduc atingere mediului 
ca fiind simple contravenții? Și răspunsul este, da, putem. Pentru a nu uh, merge într-un alt domeniu al dezbaterii și a raporta natura atât de multor infracțiuni de mediu, de uh, infracțiuni de pericol abstract, la legitimarea însăși a incriminărilor. Cu atât mai mult, am spune, cu cât majoritatea infracțiunilor de mediu sunt infracțiuni de pericol abstract, am putea, ar exista argumente pentru a le rezerva locul unor contravenții. Rămânând, să spunem, pentru un trept penal al mediului, să spunem așa, foarte, numai uh, acele fapte, acele infracțiuni, am spune, de rezultat, cu consecințe deosebit de grave, care însă și în acel caz s-ar putea dovedi ca niște variante, nu vorbim de denumiri de, de, de marginale, vorbim de calificări sistematice. Și atunci când conduita de mediu ar avea consecințe deosebit de grave, am putea vorbi de pildă despre distrugeri calificate. Dacă totuși vorbim despre un drept penal al mediului, atunci aceasta se datorează, aș spune, fără doar și poate, faptului că mediul însuși a dobândit un loc central pe planul identității normative a societății înseși. Și am spune, așa cum societatea lui, pentru societatea lui Feuerbach, divinitatea avea încă un loc central, deși întreaga paradigmă teoretică a dreptului penal modern se dovedea incapabilă de a-l mai cuprinde, era dreptul, dreptul religios, am spune, dreptul penal religios, cu, era dreptul unei societăți care mai rezista doar, ca să folosesc formula lui Alexis de Tocqueville, în ruine. Ei bine, așa cum dreptul penal modern avea dificultăți și are și acum, întreagă fie spus, cu infracțiunile religioase, din aceleași motive, aceasta este teza pe care mi-aș îngădui numai să o afirm și eventual să o propun, dezbaterii. Din aceleași motive, dreptul penal modern are încă dificultăți mari cu un sector precum infracțiunile de mediu care ține de o ordine socială care încă nu s-a instaurat. Și într-un fel a vorbit despre dreptul penal al mediului astăzi, înseamnă a elabora o concepție teoretică despre dreptul penal al unei identități sociale, despre dreptul penal care exprimă identitatea normativă a unei societăți care nu este în totalitate din viitor, dar care nu a ajuns încă să ocupe întreaga existență socială de astăzi. Și cred că oricât uh, 
aș încerca acum să prelungesc expunerea mea la un rezultat sensibil, mai precis, mă tem că nu voi putea ajunge și atunci, renoindu mi mulțumirile pentru extrem de onoranta invitație de a face parte din rândul vorbitorilor la, acest, la această conferință mondială Asociației Internaționale de Penal și mulțumindu-vă și, și dumneavoastră pentru răbdare, îmi îngădui să mă opresc aici. Vă mulțumesc! Mulțumim domnului profesor, domnului profesor Avrigianu pentru interesantele considerații, chiar dacă intervin în condițiile respective, aprecierile de valoare și cu trimitere la constante rămân valabile în orice context. Rugăm acum pentru a prezenta în cadrul secțiunii a treia, cadrul general, tema limitele și provocările sistemului penal în privința infracțiunilor de mediu, să ia cuvântul pe domnul profesor Michel For, profesor de drept internațional comparat al mediului la Universitatea din Maastricht, Olanda. Monsieur le professeur, je vous invite. Thank you. I'm waiting one moment for my sheets to appear there. And if I could ask the kind gentlemen there if they can make sure that I see the sheets in front of me on my computer as well. Someone can help me. Okay, one moment. I get a little technical assistance. Then we can go ahead. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you that there are many reasons why I feel very happy to be here in Bucharest at this moment. First of all, it is a great pleasure for me to meet many old friends, especially the president of the association, Professor John Vervale, is someone whom I know since the 1980s, since when I was a student at the University of Antwerp. He was one of my teachers. In fact, the tragedy is that he looks a lot younger than I, but he was one of my teachers indeed already in the 1980-81. And it is also a great pleasure for me to meet again Professor Mitya Duchu, because I have met him more than 20 years ago at the meeting of the Association pour la Francophonie in Togo, where we had a meeting in Lomé on environmental criminal law. So that is a great pleasure for me. The second reason why I am happy to be here, it is my very first visit to this wonderful country, Romania. And I have to say that I'm extremely impressed by the beauty of Bucharest, what I have seen so far, by the kind welcome that we have received, the wonderful food, and it is wonderful as a Belgian, just like the President John Vervale, to be able to be in a country where we can speak one of the languages of our country, French. And I apologize for holding my lecture in English to accommodate those for whom French may be slightly more difficult. There is a third reason why I'm very happy to be here, I am already working on this domain of environmental criminal law since 1986. 1986, I had a talk at the Max Planck Institute for Criminal Law with Professor Günther Heine, who at that time was leading a large project, should we protect the environment through the criminal law? Question mark. And he asked me to be working on the report for Belgium. And that was the start of my interest in this domain. And let me tell you that a few years later, we followed, we, the researchers in environmental criminal law, very closely what the IEDP was doing. 
There was a preparatory colloquium in Ottawa. There was a publication already in 1992. In 1994, there was a conference in Brazil. And there was a publication in the Revue Internationale de Droit Penal, not only of the papers, but also of the recommendations. And I see it as a great honor that I have the possibility here, let's say a bit more than 20 years later, to reflect also, and that is in fact what I will do, on what has changed since the IEDP meetings in 1992-1994. Are the limits of environmental criminal law and of the criminal law better recognized than in 1992? And are the challenges that we faced then, are they still the same? or are the challenges to some extent different? And that is precisely what I would like to do with you this morning. We have in a way seen that since you talked about this topic the first time 20 years ago, a lot has indeed changed. And Mr. President, I think that you can be proud since one of the things that I will argue during my talk is that I have the impression that many things that you have said 20 years ago as IEDP have been very influential and have led to important changes at the policy and at the legislative level. And I will try to show you that today. Since the 1990s, we have had many more insights from criminology, from law and economics. And one of the things where I think that we have advanced is that there is a better recognition of the limits of the criminal law. Let me say that when we started with this in the 1990s, there was a little bit the view that the criminal law was the only means to enforce environmental law, and that everything was focused and geared towards criminal law. And of course, increasingly, people started realizing the limits of this criminal law system and hence started looking for alternatives. And that, I think, is something that precisely the IEDP was calling for 20 years ago. Now, we do perhaps recognize the limits better, but what about the challenges? Well, I think that some of the challenges that were there in the 1990s, I name one, the criminal responsibility of corporations. In many legal systems 20 years ago, it was not recognized. Some of those issues have definitely changed. So some of the challenges have been met. However, I think that there are a couple of remaining challenges as well. And this is precisely what I would like to discuss with you during this very broad tour d'horizon that I would like to present you on what are some of the issues, limits and challenges in environmental criminal law that we probably need to face as policymakers, academics, or enforcers. If we start by the beginning, then we come to the topic that was also addressed by the previous speaker. And that topic, of course, goes to the heart of the matter, and Professor John Vervalen already discussed it during his introduction this morning as well. How does a legislator describe what is environmental crime? The very fundamental question of the criminalization. How do we criminalize such a very vague notion like pollution? You know, ladies and gentlemen, that legislators always have this dilemma, this type of paradox. On the one hand, you want to be broad. You want to encompass all the possible, also future types of pollution in your definition of environmental crime. On the other hand, you want to do it in a smart way also respecting general principles of criminal law, for example, the legality principle and the lex certa principle. So you want to describe it also with sufficient precision. And one of the challenges, obviously, is how can legislators combine those two goals? Not so easy. Here, Mr. President, is something quite interesting. If you compare, let's say, the way that environmental pollution was criminalized generally 20 years ago, and especially when we started in the 1970s and 80s, and the way that it is viewed now. If I exaggerate a little bit what was happening in the 1970s and 80s in the first legislations 
where we could see environmental criminal law. Where it was relatively simple, we had criminal law at the end of largely administrative statutes. What was criminalized? It was administrative disobedience. The fact that you did not follow the conditions of a license or you had a certain activity, an installation, and you had it without following administrative licenses or administrative permits. In other words, we had the famous dependence of the criminal law upon prior administrative decisions, again, and as you mentioned already by the President this morning. In the literature, it was indicated that this was problematic. It was problematic from a theoretical perspective. Why? Well, the ecological values, the interests, were in that way, of course, insufficiently reflected in the criminal provision. It was not the pollution, the violation of ecological interests that was penalized. No, it was violation of administrative obligations. So that already was considered an administrative, sorry, a theoretical problem. There was more. This was not merely dogmatics or theory. It led to quite a few practical problems as well. One of them being that the whole scope of protection of the criminal law was determined by administrative law. In other words, if you did not have an administrative provision that you had violated, the criminal law did not award its protection. So many were saying that this pure, or as we called it, absolute dependence of the criminal law upon administrative law was problematic. Now, this is interesting again. We saw that at the AIDP conferences, this was strongly stressed, that it would be necessary to reformulate the way that criminal law awards its protection in a more independent, in a more autonomous manner. Quite interesting, this was only strongly, also strongly voiced by someone who was present at those conferences, and I mentioned already, Günther Heine, with his project in Freiburg, which had quite a bit of influence on academia, but also on policy makers. Roughly, what was the lesson, and we heard it already from the previous speaker, of some of that legal doctrine, and also the advice of the recommendations of the IEDP. Something that was basically said by the President this morning as well. A good system of protection of environmental criminal law needs a multi-layered system. Of course you need, as was mentioned earlier, abstract endangerment crimes. If there has been a violation of an administrative obligation, sure, that should be punished in some way or another, not necessarily criminal law, but it should be prohibited. In addition, you need concrete endangerment crimes. For example, if there would be an unlawful emission, that should be criminalized as well. But interestingly, that concept unlawful could, according to some, be interpreted more broadly than merely a violation of administrative obligations. Some refer to this as what they called a relative dependence upon administrative law, not as it was before an absolute. But third, it was also held that in some cases, the crime, the pollution would be so bad that the criminal law should award its protection in a autonomous manner, independent manner. The president this morning gave the example of cases where a pollution would cause harm to human health. And there, as John Vervaler rightly mentioned, obviously following the conditions of a license would not excuse. Now, interestingly, those were suggestions made in the literature. And if you look at what happens in quite a few legal systems, Germany, Belgium, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, Portugal, the Netherlands, we see that to a large extent these advices formulated in legal doctrine, but also at the IEDP conference, were incorporated. However, I have to say that things are of course always a bit balanced. Some countries have incorporated those new, let's say more nuanced models, but there are 
many countries that have not yet done so. What especially is a problem, if you look at some of the environmental crime legislation in developing countries, they sometimes, I call it very enthusiastically, punish in general water pollution. They say, he who causes water pollution shall be punished with terrible sanctions. And we all know that these are in general ineffective provisions. Why? One simple answer, you need to prove a consequence. In other words, you need to prove causation. And then obviously the defense is relatively simple. Sure, I may have emitted, but it is not the emission that is criminalized and there may be a multi-polluter problem. And hence these type of consequential crimes very often are a problem. We did have at that time, the 1970s, 80s, other challenges as well. That had to do simply with the fact that the environmental criminal law in many legal systems did not find a very elegant place in the whole system of criminal law. Where could we find it? I told you already, it originated very often as criminal provisions that were really an add-on at the end of an administrative statute. For example, you had a law on the protection of surface waters that had a whole administrative permitting licensing system. And at the end, there was one provision saying, he who violates any provisions of this law will be punished with terrible sanctions. Now, you could say, well, what does it matter? Is it not merely academic that it is just in an administrative statute and not, for example, in the penal code. Well, no, this is not a mere academic debate. First, there is a theoretical issue that you can say, well, you know, other interests and values, life, property, honor, we all protect those individual values in the penal code. So there is something strange that even the more fundamental collective values, like ecological interests, that are to some extent fundamental and needed to enjoy individual interests, that those are not protected in the penal codes. But there is more. We had officers, prosecutors, saying that the effect is also that judges will not take environmental crime seriously if there is no incorporation in a penal code that judges still have the reflex of saying the penal code, that is serious crime, and all the others, that is special crime. And that hence, also for the way that prosecutors would treat it in the decision to prosecute or dismiss, but that judges would treat it in their sanctioning policy, did, according to some, did have an influence as well. That is why, again, the IEDP was also recommending that we should give environmental crime a more prominent place in the criminal law system. Again, a recommendation that to some extent has been followed up in many countries with, Mr. Chairman, two interesting evolutions. One evolution is that in many countries, I just name a few, but there have been more, Germany, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, we have seen incorporation of environmental crimes in the penal codes. But there is a second evolution, and according to me, as good. We have had countries, especially the Nordic countries, Sweden, Denmark, but some others as well, where we had special environmental statutes, like Sweden, for example, had an environmental code, and then the criminal law was incorporated in that environmental code. So in that respect, some of the challenges let's say that we had in the 1970s, 80s, were met. But again, the story is balanced. This is incorporated in some legal systems, but we can definitely not say that all around the world this would be the case. Quite an important question, Mr. Chairman, is of course, when you look at what was happening in the 1980s, 1990s, with environmental crime, we can also ask us a very practical question. How was this in fact enforced? What was happening 
what do we know empirically? Well, one problem is we know very little. Data are not very impressive, and I will come back to that problem in a minute. But the problem is more serious. What we did know showed us that not only theoretically, but it also in practice, the criminal law showed very important limits. Just a few rough data. You saw that in the Flemish region, if prosecutors had to take a decision, de facto only 7% of cases went to the criminal court, 64% were dismissed, and the remainder, something else happened. Other countries roughly show the same story. In the UK, we had 25,000 pollution incidents, and it was reported less than 5% were prosecuted. Similar data from Germany, again, prosecution in about 8% of the cases. So this shows you something, that we have this whole environmental crime system, wonderful dogmatics, wonderful legislation, but the number of cases reaching the criminal court is, in all cases, you saw, less than 10%. That is as far as cases reach the prosecutor is concerned. But what about inspections and monitoring? Well, there also the data are relatively dramatic. The data we do have show that the probability that you as a company will be inspected is in fact extremely low. There are data, for example, for the Flemish region in Belgium showing that on average a company has less than 1% probability of being inspected on a one-year period. And according to some, it is even less. Now, these data, of course, show us a little bit of modesty that the role of the criminal justice system apparently is relatively limited, more limited than we may expect based on theory and on what legislators always say. Now, to be very clear, prosecutors, of course, only have limited budgets. So prosecutors do have to make choices. So what do they do, given limited budgets? They will target, they will focus particular high-profile cases. And then the remainder will be what? And that was a problem in the 1970s and 80s. If it was not brought to the criminal court, the remainder of those cases were very often simply dismissed. Now, this shows you that increasingly the regime that we had in the 1980s was criticized by various stances saying such a criminal law only regime is problematic because prosecutors have only limited capacity, limited funds, can, as the data show, only bring less than 10% of the cases to court. If you don't have an alternative to do something with the 90% cases that are not prosecuted for the court, and if you believe that some remedy or some sanction is necessary either to reach deterrence or to reach at least compliance with environmental law, then these numbers are definitely problematic. What do these numbers show? These numbers show that it is not a good idea to have a model where you only rely on the criminal law. You need more than that. You need more alternatives. This is something that has been strongly advocated in different stances of literature. Again, IEDP has been advocating this, but there is more. All of you knowing a little bit of criminology know, of course, the famous enforcement pyramid of Iris and Braithwaite. And what they said was what John Vervalen already mentioned this morning. We have a whole pyramid of different type of remedies, reactions to crime, also environmental crime. The criminal law only comes on the top as an ultimum remedium ultima ratio, but there is much more that we can do until we reach the top. Interestingly, this plea 
in favor of a more nuanced approach than criminal law only, also came from a totally different scholarship, law and economics. Economists like Anthony Ogus wrote on the UK a very influential article, do we have the right regime? The UK had criminal law only. And as a result, I showed you only 5% is prosecuted. The remainder, nothing happened. That led to an influential study by Richard McCrory pleading in favor of introduction of civil penalties as alternative remedy in addition to the criminal law. Meanwhile, introduced. What is, Mr. Chairman, in fact, the general lesson of this literature? I compare it a little bit to a place that John Vervalen and I very much like to visit. You know, John Vervalen and I, we are Belgians. Where do Belgian men like to go? We like to go to a cafe where you serve beer. How do we select a good cafe? A ca good cafe is not one where you only serve blonde beer, for example, Jupiler. No. We go to a cafe, and how do we judge it? By the number of good beers, special beers they have on draft. Where you have at least 10 different beers on draft, that's a good cafe. My point is, an enforcement system for environmental violations should be like a good Belgian cafe. In other words, we need to have many options on draft. We need to have civil penalties, suasive penalties. We need to have instruments like warnings, administrative measures, safety measures, and administrative fines, and then eventually also the criminal law. This is now in the literature referred to as what we call the toolbox approach. You need to have a toolbox with different instruments of which the criminal law is only one. Again, this idea has, and this is much more recent, led in the last 10 years to a revolution in many countries. Many countries have introduced, for example, Belgium, Germany, Austria already had it, but especially UK and France, the possibility to introduce and to impose administrative fines, administrative penalties. Now, this is quite powerful. Just look at the numbers. The Flemish region, remember, 65% of environmental crime was dismissed. What then meant nothing happened. Now, with these 65%, administrative penalties are imposed. So this takes into account the limits of the criminal law system, but it offers an addition, it offers a good alternative as well. Again, Mr. Chairman, I told you many legal systems have seen the light and have introduced such a toolbox approach, providing more options to the prosecutors, to the enforcers. However, if you look at a directive on environmental crime, Professor Grazia Maria will talk about it tomorrow. Directive 2008-99 on the protection of the environment through criminal law. This morning, some speakers were already referring to it. They stick to the old language. And they mention that only the criminal penalties demonstrate a social disapproval of qualitatively different nature compared to administrative penalties or a compensation mechanism under civil law. I would say this is a little bit a pity, because it means that this environmental crime directive forces the member states only to use the criminal law. And this, to some extent, according to me, runs counter to what I consider positive and better developments in member states, where we move to a better and more nuanced toolbox approach to a variety of instruments that can be used. Of course, as a consequence of this, we say, okay, it's no longer criminal law only. But that has a few consequences and a few questions. From some of those will be addressed at this conference. Because if you say you should not necessarily 
bring all cases to the criminal court, you can handle them also through administrative measures, administrative fines. We need, let's call him or her, an orchestrator. We need someone to take decisions. Who decides what goes through which way? How do we organize that? How do we make smart mixes between the different instruments that we see that indeed things that should belong to the criminal law still end up there? and are not dealt with simply with a very minor administrative fine. It is especially Michiel Luchtman at this conference who will address some of those mixes between administrative and criminal law system. Again, it shows that also these new and interesting, and according to me, positive evolutions also bring about new and interesting challenges. There is nothing wrong with that. There are, of course, if we philosophize a little bit like we do now on an optimal environmental criminal law, other issues that we need to take into account that I want to address briefly. And also there are changes. An obvious one are the sanctions. And again, John Vervalen introduced it this morning. In the 1970s and 80s, our view was simple and maybe naive. The sanctions then used in those administrative laws were the classic ones, imprisonment and fines. And as John Vervalen already said this morning, which environmental problem do you solve by putting someone in jail? That means that if you talk about environmental crime, you need different sanctions if you want to call them effective. Again something which you can read in the recommendations of IEDP 20 years ago. It means, for example, that you need a sanction that forces the polluter to remedy all the wrong he has done in the past. For example, remove illegally deposited waste. You need also to make sure that you prevent environmental pollution from continuing. For example, the judge should have the possibility to provide an order issue an injunction and say, I also order you that that installation, which was at the basis of the crime, cannot be used anymore in the future. And you should accompany that maybe with a penalty payment to make sure that they also comply with it. And logically, within this framework, you also should make sure that if people, for example, were running a factory two years without a permit, that the logical sanction would be that you say all the profit that you have been making illegally during that period was the result of illegal activities, hence of crime, and should hence be confiscated and be forfeited as well. That is a consequence of the adagium that crime should not pay. Of course, if you look at what's happening in countries, the story is again the same. Yes. Many legislations, modern legislations, now have a long list of specific sanctions that we can impose, positive evolution. But again, I can also point at many countries that don't have it. And again, the problem is that even the countries that do have what we call the complementary sanctions do not always apply them in practice. Prosecutors may not be aware, may not ask it, judges may not know, and judges, you know, they have this old habit of imprisonment, fine. That's what a penal judge knows. That's what he likes to apply. So even there, there is still more work to do. Another issue, which of course addresses and focuses on the effectiveness of environmental criminal law, obviously the actor. And here, I really think that things have changed. I'm never going to say that things are solved. I simply say that things have changed. In the IEDP, 20 years ago, we were saying the real actor in environmental crime is the corporation. And remember, 20 years ago, many countries still had this adagium, societas delinquere non potest, or at least if they do do crimes, they were not able to have sanctions. Now, there have been enormous evolutions in the sense that many legal systems now accept 
criminal responsibility of the corporation, and even those that don't, allow to impose sanctions on the corporations under an administrative nature, and still the result may effectively be the same. Does it mean there are no challenges at all left? Oh, sure. Still, there are countries that do not effectively address the corporation. Other challenges are also, it's not sufficient merely to focus on the corporation. What about the accumulation with the individual actors? Also, people often say criminal law is still addressing individual behavior. It may not be the case that someone organizes all of his bad activities in a corporation and that we only focus on the corporation that would subsequently go bankrupt and get all the sanctions which are totally meaningless. Another interesting challenge is what about the black box of the corporation? What if you have that corporation, 10,000 people working there, and they have all kind of internal compliance mechanisms, and they do self-reporting, and they do self-auditing. What is the value of those self-reporting mechanisms in the area of the criminal law? Should we, like in some legal systems, reward self-reporting by the corporation? They go out, they come out, and they say, there was indeed environmental crime here, I report it. Should that have the effect of reducing, for example, the penalty? Those are issues that are still very much debated and still will for a moment. Mr. Chairman, what I consider to be one of the most important problems in the near future is not so much the formulation of environmental crime. Let me say all of the theoretical issues, I think there we have done a lot of work in the last 20 years. What is the problem? According to me, to put it very simple, if you go to the practical level of enforcement, I am very much afraid that to a large extent, we have no idea what we're doing. Let me tell you what I mean. I think that if you think seriously about enforcement and you want effectiveness, you believe in big words like deterrence, compliance. You need to know something about your input. You should be able to say, what is the number of inspectors, police, other officers that are devoted to, for example, monitoring and to inspection? Many countries, we have no idea. Of course, you should also know how much in real full-time equivalent can they devote to inspection? Sometimes you have 100 people, like in local communities, formally they have the task to control compliance with environmental law. De facto, they sit behind the desk, do hundreds of other things, and they have one hour a week to do compliance tasks. That doesn't work. What about the number of installations that they need to control? How many people do you have to control 1,000? or 10,000 or 50,000 installations. If you really believe in deterrence, you want to know what is the probability that a company gets a visit from an inspector on a yearly basis. But you can continue. Not only numbers on the input of enforcement of efforts are often lacking. Also, if we go to the output, what were the number of inspections? What were the violations found? What were the remedies? Some countries, I'm proud to say, the Flemish region in Belgium, yes, does have data. But I can tell you, I looked at many other countries, and I can say that we are almost the only one. Even a modern country like the Netherlands has very limited data in this respect. Let alone, Mr. Chairman, that we would know outcomes. What do I mean with outcomes? that we know effectively what is the result of enforcement for public welfare. Did enforcement increase environmental quality? By the end of the day, that's not a strange question, is it? I think that that's what we really want enforcement to do. Of course, it is difficult. I do realize that. But I think that that is the big challenge in the future. If we believe that we deal with enforcement in a more scientific way, way, that means that we really need more data. Why do I mention that? I mention that because nowadays we say we need 
smart enforcement. And tomorrow, Kathleen Ligeti will talk about smart enforcement in more detail. What do we mean with that? Well, again, this is something which was not on the agenda 20 years ago, which is on the agenda now. This is something which really has come up the last five years, and I think this will determine the agenda the next 10 years. You know, in the past, we did random inspections, or if I put it impolitely, we basically had no idea. We just sent out people, or even worse, we didn't do proactive controls or inspections, but only reactive. We waited until there were complaints, we waited for the pollution to occur, and then the police went out to see what was happening. If you talk about smart enforcement, what do you mean? You mean, first of all, that ex ante, you do a programming, you do a risk assessment, you do targeting, you do filtering. You go out and you say, what is the probability that with these type of companies, violations will take place? And if violations take place, what may be the social loss? What may be the environmental damage? And on that basis, you make different risk groups. And based on the risk profile, you say how often you want to visit those particular companies. That is ex ante risk assessment. But of course, you don't only do it ex ante, ex post. After you have seen violations, you will see that if there is a company that had two, three violations in a year, surely those guys will be monitored more closely. So what is the key word here? That enforcement should be evidence-based. That we don't do just random controls, but we do it in an evidence-based way, based on what we know. But that again, as I was showing you, needs, of course, data. Therefore, these data are crucial. Again, we see that, for example, there is in the OECD guidelines on regulatory enforcement and inspections of 2014. Those guidelines basically are, let's say, the rule book for how to do smart enforcement. Very interesting, excellent. We also have, already from 2001, an EU recommendation on minimum criteria for inspections. Again, excellent. But what is the problem? As we all know, a recommendation is a non-binding instrument. That recommendation, for example, says that all the member states have an obligation to report data to the European Commission. Who does it? No one. No data there. Uh, recently, the European Commission, according to me, rightly so, tried to change this from a non-binding guideline into a directive. Large opposition from the member states. Are you crazy? Not more Europe. They were against it. So there again, I think that this is, let's say, for the coming 10 years, one of the challenges. How can we actively collect data in the countries, but even better, if you look at the European level in a harmonized manner, if you believe in creating a level playing field between the member states, I believe that we should at least know what is going on, not only formally harmonize legislation on which Mircea Ducciu will talk again tomorrow, but also look that enforcement efforts enhance enforcement pressure on industry in all the member states is more or less similar. That, according to me, is one of the challenges for Europe to realize in the next 10 years. And only if, if we have those data can we make work of smart evidence-based enforcement. You know, this smart enforcement is especially important in times of budget cuts. Now, you know, Europe talks only about crisis. And then especially, with the little money that you have, you should use your inspections in a very targeted way, that you know that you have an optimal benefit from the little efforts that you can use. And there is evidence that it works. There is a lot of empirical evidence, one that I like very much, there has been a comparison as far as occupational health and safety is concerned between the UK and Germany. Germany had five times more inspections and inspectors for occupational health and safety than the UK. And Germany also had five times more fatal accidents at work than the UK. And what was the explanation, according to some of the literature? 
Germany does random in inspections, not focused, and the UK is one of the countries which is most advanced with smart enforcement, and they had a compliance strategy. They were in conversation with the industry, and according to that literature, it means smart enforcement pays off also in terms of improving public welfare. So this, according to me, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, is something that also we in the environmental area should take seriously. Not only focus on material environmental criminal law, there I think we have in the past 20 years done a lot of work and a lot has happened. And I think that now for the next years, the focus should be on how can we make enforcement more effective as well. Mr. Chairman, I come to a few concluding remarks. I have been trying to provide you an overview of limits and challenges in the domain of environmental criminal law. And I have also been looking a bit at what did our colleagues 20 years ago at the IEDP conferences, IEDP in Ottawa and in Rio, what did they say at the time and what has changed? Well, I think, honestly, a lot has changed. And in that sense, President Vervalen, you can be proud. I don't say that there is a causal relationship between an IEDP conference and changes. The only thing that I can say is that obviously those people that were in the driving seat in IEDP also had an influence in their countries and were apparently able to convince legislators to go in a different way. It is striking, for example, that now many legislators realize much better than, let's say, 20 years ago, some of the limits of the criminal justice system in environmental crime. How do we see that? Well, that toolbox approach that I talked about is now increasingly introduced in many legal systems. And it means that what we did 20 years ago, exclusively relying on the criminal law, fortunately, we don't do that anymore. We have also defined environmental crime in a smarter way, no longer dependent on administrative law, but a much more nuanced system where the relationship to administrative law becomes more loose when the violation of the interest at stake become much more serious. It means, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President, that I think that many of the challenges that we had 20 years ago at the IEDP have been met successfully. But there is always a but, there is always more work. I think that there are many remaining challenges as well. I told you, open the legislation of some developing countries and you will see very broad, vague notions whereby they just criminalize environmental pollution. As I told you, it looks beautiful in practice you know that it will not be applied. The toolbox approach that I advocated, including administrative civil penalties, is applied in many countries, but definitely not in all. And I told you already, complementary sanctions, yes, we see it in many countries, but even there, it's not always applied. And there are also still countries that have to get used to the idea that criminal law is not only about imprisonment and fines. Still quite a bit of work to do. I told you already that I think it is extremely important that we not only have a very good description of the prohibited behavior, but that it is quite important that we now focus much more on the practical side, on the smart enforcement. I sometimes have the impression that the enforcers that try to do their best and go after environmental crime are a bit like the title of the wonderful movie by Lars von Trier, A Dancer in the Dark, because they basically have no idea what's going on. If you have no data, what are you going to do if you have no evidence? So according to me, I think that a good and effective system of data collection on inspections, monitoring and remedies is absolutely crucial. And I think, Mr. Chairman, that that is crucial for one reason. We really want to increase the effectiveness of environmental crime.
criminal law. Mulțumim, domnului profesor Michel Ford, pentru această comunicare deosebit de interesantă, care a îmbinat aproape perfect rigoarea comunicării științifice și pasiunea pledoariei în favoarea mediului. Regret că acum 20 de ani vorbeam cu toți în franceză și participații francezi eram dominanți, chiar dacă într-o țară din Africa, precum Togo, la Lome, și astăzi aproape că reprezentații francezi lipsesc cu desăvârșire. Sperăm că noi românii, ca țară gazdă, îi suplinim și mai ales în calitate de continuatori a acelor tradiții juridice comune. Dacă din partea dumneavoastră, pe, pe baza celor prezentate de domnul profesor For, un excelent cadru general de discuții, sunt comentarii, puncte de vedere și de ce nu întrebări care să fie adresate celui care a susținut comunicarea respectivă. Nu există nicio întrebare? Toată lumea e lămurită, ori invers? Vă rog. Okay. 22 years ago, Professor Dutsu wrote a book called uh, Between to Be and to Have. It's 22 years ago. I remember that uh, very well. So the question yeah, is sure. uh, now between uh, budgeting law and criminal law or budgeting prosperity. I teach tax law to my students. And uh, I teach them that it's a competition between prosperity and uh, law enforcement budgeting. So I go back 22 years ago to that question between to have and to be. So if you ask to this question, it's more real to approach the system. Thank you. Well, that's, that's an excellent comment, and I, I, I thank you very much for this observation. And I think that you are quite right that there is many parallels between the tax inspections and the enforcement problems that arise in taxation and the environmental area. And of course, it is a very broad and important point that you make, having to do with fundamental choices that we make in society. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we often have in environmental law is that politicians will exercise pressure on enforcement agencies to say, come on, come on, think a bit about industry. It's crisis now. Let's not make it too heavy. We, we don't make, make a fox hunt out of it. Uh, please, please, be a bit calm. Think about my voters and so on. There, there is people working there. And in some cases it goes as far as removing budgets and so, and, and for enforcers that can be extremely frustrating. Of course, in some countries, we have similar stories in the tax area as well, that we sometimes say it's a competition to attract company with lenient conditions and not too strong enforcement and so. You know what I always answer to those type of stories, and I say it often to enforcers to encourage them a bit. There is this very famous research by a guy from Harvard, not a bad university, Michael Porter. Michael Porter developed what has become known as the Porter Hypothesis. He proclaimed that if you have stringent environmental law, stringent enforcement, that leads to more investments in innovation by the companies, otherwise you cannot comply. That innovation to comply with environmental law leads also to technological innovation 
which leads to higher profits for the company. So the Porter hypothesis is stringent environmental law does not retard economic growth, it stimulates profits for a company. And there is increasing empirical evidence that this is true not only at the company level, but also at the country level. So that those countries that in fact enforce that have stringent norms for environmental law, they get a bit what is sometimes known as the California effect. As you know, California is one of the most stringent states in the US. Very high norms, tries to externalize them, all kinds of stories and so, stringent enforcement. Yet, California is also one of the most prosperous states as well. And that, to some, is seen as evidence of the Porter hypothesis. That indeed, in those cases, you see that stringent environmental law, innovation and prosperity go hand in hand. Not only at the company level, but also at the, at the state level. I find that always extremely important because the point that you, of course, hint at is that politicians will very often not be interested in enforcement of environmental law, especially in times of crisis. Then they say, oh, we have other priorities. And now, you know, like, like with the terrorists and with the refugees, you know, environmental law can wait. We have other things to do. And then the answer is, of course, no. Look at Michael Porter. If you want economic growth, start with stringent environmental law and believe in this innovation story. That's, I mean, that's something that you can at least tell them. Although I know, in practice, of course, things are never that easy. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, ladies and gentlemen, needless to say that Michael Ford was an excellent student and already an excellent speaker at the time, <laughs> and he still is. Um, I want to ask a question reasoning about your metaphor of uh, the visit to the Belgian bar. Um, if we go to such a bar together, we are of course not looking only at the quantity of draft beers, but also of the people behind the bar who are tapping the beer. Uh, because that is as important. And so when we speak about enforcement, mostly, and I think also in your, in your uh, explanation, we are thinking about public authorities specialized police, prosecutors, uh, whatever, and judges, of course, that's a whole chain of the, the, the public authorities. My question is the following. Do you see space for private authorities belonging to civil society when it comes to enforcement? And not only, I'm not speaking only about uh, exchange of data or evidence, but also, let's say, public-private partnerships when it comes to enforcement. Because that's also a topic that I think 20 years ago was completely absent. Again, uh, excellent question, John, and I, I think you're right. Uh, you know, the problem is a little bit that in that respect, we may have been too conservative in the sense that when we talk about enforcement, and especially the administrative and criminal law enforcement, so let's say leading to public enforcement, we traditionally only think in terms of public officers when we talk about civil society, we say, yes, wonderful, as long as you talk about private enforcement, or if you talk about data exchange and so, all of that is wonderful. You know what, what the, the double thing a little bit is, when you talk to public enforcers and you say, you can use all of that knowledge that is available in civil society, for example, make use of all the complaints that are there. Very often, I hear inspectors and monitors getting very nervous say, oh, but there is so much noise there. You know, these people come with any complaint and there is always the same who come with 20 complaints in one day and so. I think all of that, for a moment, we have to put aside. When you say more seriously, can we have public-private partnerships in the area of law enforcement? I think absolutely. There is, of course, quite a literature on the area of private prisons. Uh, the Law and Economic Scholarship is relatively enthusiastic there and says, well, there may be advantages. Of course, there is lots of, let's say, social dilemmas and so on, and, and fundamental questions on, is that the task that you can delegate, uh, to, that, that you can delegate to, to private entities? But what you see in the literature and the experiences on the private prisons is that there, of course, the crucial issue is you can agree on targets. 
that you say these are the targets that we have to agree on, also concerning quality and so on, and that on the condition that you do that, the story is that you hope that with the engagement of private parties, you would get better incentives than mainly with government. The problem, of course, with government, as we often say, it is a monopoly. It suffers from bureaucracy problems and so, and therefore all of the smartness that we may hope may sometimes lack in a, in a government organization. For that reason, yes, John, uh, I, I quite agree with you, and I think that this is something that for the next years will be something that we would have to investigate. Of course, one of the challenges will be that there will be quite a bit of opposition from inside the bureaucracy. As you know that in many countries now there are budget cuts, and if then the result is that they say, well, we will now, let's say, fire civil servants and rather give the money to private entities, I would personally say if the private entities can provide better quality at a lower price or even the same quality at a lower price, why not think about engaging private entities as well? Um, my fear is a little bit there will be quite a bit of opposition. But of course, opposition is not a reason not to take this seriously. Excellent question. Thanks, John. Și noi vă mulțumim. Alte comentarii, alte întrebări? Dacă nu mai sunt, și ați preîncheia prima parte a dezbaterilor noastre în tonul dat de domnul profesor Michel For cu dispozitivele de bere, sunt sigur că dacă în Bruxelles sunt 10, numai la un singur dispozitiv curge gheoza. A gheoza, ținut și al bier, că el există urmă în Bruxelles, nu? La gheoza e un șostre rar, nu? Gheoza este un sort de bere pentru români care se fabrică numai la Bruxelles, într-un cartier unde există o ciupercă și este o bere specială, apreciată de Voltaire. Remarca mea a fost următoarea, ca să înțeleagă, v-am înțeles numai cei doi. E adevărat că poți să încerci 10 la compresoare de bere, 10 calități de bere, dar probabil că numai la un singur compresor curge gheoza adică berea specifică Bruxellesului, care e foarte rară și apreciată de uh, o anumită parte a publicului. Luăm pauză aici, ne întâlnim la ora 14, până atunci servim masa de prânz în sistem catering, uh, imediat la dreapta, dacă nu mă înșel, și revenim la ora 14 pentru a continua dezbaterile noastre. Vă mulțumim pentru participare.